Good to be alive in this land of ours. Good to drive in this land of ours. Hello, Canada hockey fans in the United States. And good evening, everybody from Midtown Toronto. My name is Steve Pakin, and it truly is my honor to be hosting tonight's very nostalgic um, extravaganza on what is one of the most important anniversaries coming up on the hockey calendar. There are precious few things that we still talk about 70 years after the fact, but we will do that tonight because one of the most magic and tragic events on the hockey calendar happened 70 years ago next week. The Toronto Maple Leafs, of course, won the Stanley Cup. Game five, overtime goal by Bill Barilko. That was April 21st, 1951. Leafs three, Canadians two. Four months later, Barilko goes on a fishing trip. He disappeared for more than a decade after dying in a plane crash. As we say, from magic to tragic. So tonight, we're going to look back at the events of 70 years ago. We're going to do it in two ways. First, part one tonight on... StreamYard, the platform you're watching right now. And then we'll do part two on Zoom, where we will continue the discussion and let those of you who are watching ask your questions of some of the participants that we're bringing together tonight to talk about those events of 70 years ago. And we start off going to Minnetonka, Minnesota, and we introduce Frank Klisinich, who is the nephew of Bill Barilko. Frank, it's great to see you tonight, and perhaps we could just have you explain right off the top how it is that you are related to Bill Barilko. Uh, great to be with you, Steve. Uh, I am uh, the oldest nephew of Billy. Uh, my mom was his uh, sister, and they had three kids in the Barilko family, uh, uh, Alec, Billy, and then my mom, Ann. Now, let's and uh, she passed away in 2013, and she said to me, Frank, uh, I want you to represent the family on all things Barilco, and that means I've worked very closely with Kevin, and uh, I'll try and do my very best. Kevin, of course, being Kevin Shea, Kevin who wrote Shea. about a decade ago uh, the definitive work on your uncle. Let's leave hockey aside for a second, Frank. Can, can you tell us maybe some memories about what your mother thought of Billy, as you call him, as a brother? Never mind a hockey player, but as a brother. Uh, my mom, uh, being the youngest, looked up to her two older brothers, and uh, she thought they were both terrific people. Uh, of course, Billy and Alec went on to play professional hockey starting out, out in California in the Pacific Coast League. She just thought they were just two great brothers. And uh, I, I, I know that she never dreamed that uh, Bill would become famous uh, and that the things that he would do at a very young age uh, would be so dramatic and, uh, and, and he'd be part of a hockey team and become a legend in uh, Toronto Maple Leaf hockey history, uh, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons. Uh, a plane crash and, uh, and, uh, and off he went. Well, you mentioned California, so let's continue the story there. How does a kid from Timmins, Ontario, end up playing in Hollywood in the Pacific Coast Hockey League? Uh, Billy, uh, one of his nicknames was uh, Hollywood Bill. Uh, he, at 18 years old, he and his brother Alec are offered uh, an opportunity to play in the Pacific Coast League. And uh, I, I, this is the part of the story that I find absolutely phenomenal. At 18 years old, getting on a plane for the first time, uh, going all the way to Los Angeles, California. And uh, at, uh, we're coming from Timmins, Ontario, uh, where I was born and, and raised. Uh, maybe twelve or 15,000 people uh, out to uh, glamorous uh, Hollywood, California. It must have been a, a remarkable trip. And somehow he makes it from California to the Leafs. How did that happen? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the plan was that there were injuries 
uh, at at the uh, in the farm system went to uh, uh, Pacific Coast League Hollywood, uh, Oklahoma to Pittsburgh, and then the and the big team uh, Toronto, and he was supposed to be going uh, to Pittsburgh to fill in uh, a, a gap due to injuries, and the Leafs uh, told uh, the Pittsburgh Hockey Club, uh, tell him to keep going northbound because we need another defenseman on the Leaf team. And he, I don't know how he got there, but it was, uh, he flew to Pittsburgh and then uh, trains, planes, and automobiles. Uh, he landed in Toronto and uh, there he was, uh, a kid of, uh, of 19 years old uh, with a big team. Hmm. Going to ask our friend Glenn Dreyfus to roll some video here because your uncle's nickname was Bashan Bill Barilko. And we're going to take a look at some of the hits that he was uh, reputed for. Let's put it that way. There he is. There's Bash and Bill right there. He was a pretty tough customer, eh, Frank? Uh, he was a great, uh, tough player. Uh, one year he led the league in penalty minutes. Uh, I he, Billy was one of those guys that uh, no one was going to push the Toronto Maple Leaf team around, and he was famous for his uh, hip check, and you can see this clip right here. If you, got your, if you had your head down and uh, Billy would uh, line you up and you were going to be on the ice. <laughs> Now, your uncle scored five playoff goals in 47 playoff games over almost five seasons with the Leafs. And amazingly, here we are 70 years later, and we are still talking about one forgettable, unforgettable goal that was made unforgettable in part because of the guy who did the play-by-play. -play. Here's how it sounded 70 years ago next Wednesday. Go ahead, Glenn. Foster Hughes. Watson comes back fast at center ice, steaming down the left wing. Into the corner, shoots and hits the side of the net. Here's right in front of Meeker. Meeker went by the net, centers out in front. McNeil fell right in front again. Watson shoots. Meeker to score! Barocco! Barocco has won the Stanley Cup for the lead. Barocco shoots it into the net while McNeil was left all by himself. They draw to meet the Leafs and the world champion. Frank, when you hear that call from Foster Hewitt, how does your spine feel? Well, I get goosebumps and my eyes are watering. Uh, how exciting that is. I've been true blue Maple Leaf hockey fan all my life. And every time I see that, I think that's my uncle. And it's just, it's fabulous. I, I, I love seeing it. Thank you. In your view, is that the most memorable goal ever scored in Toronto Maple Leaf history? Well, I'm biased, but the answer would be yes. I can't think of anything that comes... I can't think of anything that comes even a close second. And I'm not biased. Um, you know, the Bobby Orr goal is the other goal scored by a famous defenseman flying through the air. Uh, but that wasn't for the Maple Leafs. That was for somebody else. So I would say that's it. I'm glad I have your vote on that too. Absolutely. <laughs> now, we're going to do some uh, more pictures. Glenn, maybe you can bring these up. Here's from the winning dressing room after the game. And your uncle... Frank, he's on top of the world when he sees all this, right? Oh, undoubtedly. And he's all of uh, 24 years old. And they have won the Stanley Cup. And that was his fourth cup in five years, right? That is correct. There he is. And the big kiss coming in. Look at that. And one of the remarkable sidebars of Bill Barocco, uh he played tough. He played uh, defense. He blocked shots. He checked fearlessly, and he didn't have a stitch. He, there was he doesn't have any cuts. He had all his teeth, and uh, I remember uh, my grandmother uh, Baba used to say, you know, he's he 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 just plays fearlessly, but he's never been injured. Hmm. A bit like the Muhammad Ali of his day. Muhammad yeah. was fairly pretty as well. That's correct, and he's hmm. a good-looking young man. That uh, Bill Barocco. Mm -hmm. Now, your uncle, as we've pointed out, and as we've seen, had movie star good looks. And uh, we have a little video here of him offering Christmas wishes back in the day. Glenn, let's roll that. All right. From Timmins via Hollywood, a defenseman came to the Maple Leafs, Bill Barilko. Bill? Thank you, Wes. I'd like to say hello and a uh, very Merry Christmas to my mother and sister in Timmins and to all my friends there and uh, to say hello to all my radio fans, sort of say, in Toronto and District. Okay, uh, Bill, and there's one thing I would like to ask you. What about uh, a win tonight for those kids down at the gardens on Young Canada night? Well, they can use one, and so can we. What do you think of your chances of getting a couple of wins this Christmas and giving the fans a real present? Well, Santa Claus better be around then. 
Hmm. What do you think when you hear that voice? Uh, it, it, he had a great voice, and, uh, and, and he was an awfully good-looking young man. <laughs> now, he wins the Stanley Cup in April of 1951. In June of 1951, something else fairly important happens in the Barilko family. What was that? <laughs> Well, I, that's when I arrived. <laughs> you were born in June of 51. That is correct. Now, are there any pictures of you and your uncle that last to this day? Uh, I'd have to go back into uh, my mom's scrapbooks, which I, I have. Um, I think there's a picture with him holding me as an infant, uh, but I'd, I'm going to have to dig that one out. Hmm. And after he won the Stanley Cup, I mean, he had the summer off, obviously. And do, do you know what he did during that summer? Well, I know Billy loved fishing and hunting. Uh, I know that he loved getting together with his buddies, uh, the Keurig family, uh, who happened to own the Victory Hotel. And that was where the boys went for, uh, for draft beer. And uh, they'd sort of congregate and uh, head out and I think had a pretty good time. Hmm. Now, we are going to leave the details because I frankly don't want to put you through that. We're going to leave the details till Kevin Shea later in our broadcast tonight about the fishing trip itself and your uncle's disappearance. But I will ask you this. Um, in the uh, more than a decade that your uncle was missing uh, after the plane crashed, maybe you could give us some insight into how the family dealt with that. Did they talk about it, for example? When I was, uh, when we grew up in Timmins, we never talked about Billy. It was very infrequent. Uh, and, and I was too young to truly comprehend why. As I got older, um, I, I realized that it was such a painful discussion to talk about Billy because he hadn't been found. The plane crash hadn't been confirmed. Bill Barocco was still missing. And my grandmother, my dear Baba Barocco, always held out this small little minuscule hope that Billy would reappear magically. He had amnesia, um, that he was still alive. And, and for that reason, it was never discussed when we lived in Timmins. Only when we moved to London and then we got news that the crash had been, uh, the site had been found. And then we actually went to Timmins for a funeral. Um, that That's when my brother and I started better understanding the dynamic history of Bill Barocco with the Toronto Maple Leaf Hockey Club. And as we got older, we learned much more about it. Hmm. Now, you would have been in London, Ontario, what, like a kid of 11 years old or something when the news Correct. came in? Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember it? Oh, I remember going up to the, uh, up to Timmins and it was a, I mean, there was, there were hockey players at the funeral that were my, that were my idols. Um, Mahavlich and Stanley, and there's Alan Stanley, um, uh, and there, you know, there we are standing at the end of the, uh, at the, at the, at the coffin. And it was, again, one of those surreal situations. We're putting a coffin into the ground, but there's no body in it. There, mm -hmm. Bill, Billy wasn't there, but we were going through the ceremony. And that was a cathartic experience because it was something we needed to do as a family <clears throat> to get past the fact that Billy was not alive. And uh, we, was, he was, we were having a funeral for him. Did, did the certainty of the news that you now knew he was dead, did that give the family some peace finally? Yes, it did. Absolutely. It, um, I know it gave my grandmother peace uh, that she could finally come to grips with. There was no one one hundredth of a percent that he was still going to magically reappear. So it allowed us to have closure on something that was quite painful. And what do you think that decade of not knowing did to your family? It was just a strange situation where we, I, I, I again, when I got older, I, I then I started appreciating and understanding the why. Uh, and then as we got into the six, the seventies and the Toronto Maple Leaf Hockey Club started recognizing alumni and recognizing some of the history in a more meaningful way, especially in the eighties, that's when the story of Bill Barocco became much more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Well, we should remind everybody here that, you know, Bill won four of those five cups. The Leafs were a hell of a dynasty in the 1940s. And then yes, he were. disappeared and they didn't win the cup again for another 11 years till 1962. Coincidentally, the same year they found him, they found the remains. And I presume over the years you have considered 
how eerie that is that the team would have won nothing until the mystery was resolved. Until they found that plane, plane crash site, the Leafs didn't win the Stanley Cup. How and eerie? Yes, eerie, eerie is, is absolutely appropriate. Speaking of appropriate, how appropriate do you find the monument that is in Timmins, which is your uncle's final resting place? How, how do you like what they've done there? Oh, I think it's fa- I think it's fabulous, and all there are stories about a puck's always on the uh, on the on the tombstone, and it's one of the most uh, uh, requested. People are requesting to know where did, where's Barocco buried. Um, it's it's got a beautiful picture of Billy, and I think it's a memorial that uh, that that lasts forever and is part of uh, a, Tim, a legacy of Timmins. Well, we're here tonight, uh, very close to the 70th anniversary, but I want to take you back now 20 years to the 50th anniversary, because we're going to play some footage from the 50th anniversary of your uncle's goal, and we'll take you back to the Air Canada Centre, and here's the public address announcer, Andy Frost, 20 years ago. Go ahead, Glenn. Frank, were you there that night? Uh, no, I was not. Your mom I, was at center ice, though. She sure was. And and <clears throat> I'm just watching that clip and, and thinking just how proud she would be today that here we are talking about it. She represented the Barocco family with, with grace and dignity, and she was so proud and so happy and so wonderfully pleased that the story of Bill Barocco lived on at 50 years and here we are 70 at the 70th anniversary and still talking about it so there's a lot of people up in the big sky that are looking down smiling right now and are very happy we should just explain as well that th- those were a bunch of uh, bill's teammates from that 51 squad yeah. at center ice along with the tragically hip with the handwritten and framed lyrics as penned by gord downey from the tragically hip and i wonder how how influential do you think that song, the 50 Mission Cap, has been in keeping the legacy going. Oh, enormous. Um, we're grateful and uh, to the Tragically Hip and Gord Downey and, and the members of the band for for that song. Um, it it brought the story of Bill Barocco to a to a, a new generation and and it made it alive and 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 having the banner in and Maple Leaf Gardens and then becoming Air Canada Center and now Scotia. Scotia Bank. What the tragically hip did was to continue the story, and uh, and and it's just it's remarkable. Yeah, there was a time in Maple Leaf Gardens. I know, of course, in the new building, they've got lots of banners up there. But for the longest time, it was five and six for Ace Bailey, and that was it. Yeah, What'd your family were, think of that? Those were the only two permanently retired numbers. Um, and then they started honoring numbers. And a couple of years ago, I was at the ceremony where they permanently retired a lot of numbers. For example, 27 representing Sittler and Mahavlich. Uh, but we were extremely proud of the fact that there's our, there's Uncle Billy's five. Memor- that memory will never uh, go away. It's always going to be part of the uh, Maple Leaf Hockey Club for every fan to look up in the rafters and see. Hmm. There's a story about the Tragically Hip playing a concert in Mississauga. And your mother, well, why don't you pick it up from there? Well, my my mom calls me and says, Frank, <clears throat> are you? Do you know about a, a band named the Tragically Hip? And I said, No, I don't. And you know, at this time, when she's asking me, uh, we're living in Mississauga. We've got three kids. We've got an active household, and I'm not exactly keeping up with new rock and roll bands. So I said, Mom, I uh, I have no, I've never heard of them. And she said, Well, they made they wrote a song about Billy. I said, oh, really? What's it called? Uh, 50 Mission Cap. 
I said, what's that name got to do with Bill Barocco? And she said, I don't know, but I'm going to go over to the Hershey Center. They're playing a concert and I'm going to I'm going to go and introduce myself. I said, go get them, mom. So later that day, we heard the story. She she knocks on the on the door at the Hershey Center it's well before their concert. And uh, the guard says, uh, yeah, who are you? He says, well, I'm Bill Barocco's sister and I'd like to meet the tragically hip. And she said, a lot of people would like to meet the tragically hip. She said, I'm Bill Barocco's sister. They wrote a song about him. He said, I'll go back and check. Well, lo and behold, she gets brought into the Hershey Center. She meets the band. They tell her, come on back for our concert. And she said, no, I got to go and make home um, uh, dinner for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't stay for the concert. She did not know. She went back to the condominium in Mississauga, and uh, and so she we told she told us the story later, and eventually, of course, uh, she got to know them in, in a much more meaningful way. And, and the, the ceremony, the fiftieth ceremony, where they were all attending, was absolutely spectacular. It sure was. We're going to look at some pictures now of your mother at the Hockey Hall of Fame, where, of course, she was a volunteer, and. Uh, responsible for, I guess, or overseeing. Uh, there's the skates of your uncle. Yeah. That's the display. Now, you hinted at this earlier, but I wonder if you could go into some more detail here, Frank. Your mother died in 2013. Yes. And one of the last things she did, I gather, was task you with what? Well, she said, Frank, uh, the Barocco name is going to continue to be part of the Ma Toronto Maple Leaf Hockey Club and I want you to have most of the memorabilia. My brother got some of it, but mo all the scrapbooks, uh, some of the uh, trophies. The one over my shoulder uh, is the 4748 uh, uh, gift that the players were given. It's a replica of the Stanley Cup. But she said, Frankie, I want you to take care of this. Uh, make sure your children understand who Bill Barocco was. And now I'm making sure my grandchildren understand uh, but she said, you're going to represent the, the, the Barocco family. And she said, because I know you'll do it well. And uh, I, I take that responsibility seriously and, uh, and with great honor. You are doing it extremely well. I want to ask you, though, about the family name, because as you pointed out off the top, the oldest brother was Alec. He had no children. Correct. Then Bill, who, of course, died too young to have kids. And then your mother, who, of course, took on another name. So the, the Barilco name. What is the status of that today? Well, uh, there's no direct descendants of uh, Alec because uh, he didn't have kids. And uh, Billy, of course, didn't get married and have kids. So there's no more uh, Barilcos coming down the line. But that doesn't stop us from uh, remembering it and, uh, and, and keeping it strong. Well, we played the clip from 20 years ago. I say let's play the clip from 10 years ago because they recognize the 60th anniversary of this great goal as well. Glenn, if you would. Please welcome. sister of the 51 cup winning goal scorer Bill Barilko, accompanied by her son Barry and Barilko Klesanich. And joining in for the face-off, Mr. Howie Meeker. One, two, three, let her go. There you go. Isn't that sweet? It is. How it is. Was, now, did Howie pass the puck to Bill? I'm trying to remember who brought the puck out from behind the net. We're going to have to go back and watch that clip again. <laughs> I think it might have been. We will see that clip again before we're done today. I, I do want to ask you this, though. I mean, we saw the 50th. We saw the 60th anniversary. 70th anniversary is next week, but the Leafs are on the road. And even if they were at home, there's COVID-19 and there wouldn't have been any people in the building. So no, cer I called the Leafs and there's no ceremony planned as a result. How disappointing is that for you? Well, uh, I was very much hoping that in uh, 2021, uh, I would be making a trip back to Toronto. Uh, and that's a trip that I love doing. And we do it frequently. Haven't been in Toronto since March of last year because of this COVID nonsense. But uh, I think there's uh, eventually the lease will catch up to the celebration of the 70th anniversary. It's just going to take time before people can, you know, the fans can be back in the stands. Gotcha. Frank, I want to ask you one more question. And that is that, had this awful tragedy not befallen your family, your uncle would have turned 94 years old last month. And I wonder whether you ever think about the life he might have led or the relationship you might have had with him over the years. 
Oh, that's a great question, Steve. Uh, yes, I have thought about that. Uh, I've thought about what it would have been like watching him play for the Leafs. Uh, he was so he was a kid that came out of Northern Ontario from Timmins and 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 worked hard to improve his hockey skills. Uh, when he got there, he became a a really uh, in, he became part of the team. And and as I recall from Howie Meeker, uh, the 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 captain was Teeter Kennedy, but the heartbeat of this team was Bill Barocco. Uh, I would have loved to have watched him continue his career. I think the Leafs would have won a few more cups. It wouldn't have been as long as sixty two, and. Uh, I would have loved seeing him retire and and what he did with his career and uh, and and seeing him just uh, wherever he whatever he was going to do with that. Um, I, I I wish I would have had the opportunity to get to know my uncle. Frank, we are so grateful to you for spending so much time with us tonight and and doing honor to your mother's last wishes, which were to keep this legacy going. You're doing a great job of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. It's my pleasure. Frank Klisinich in Minnetonka, Minnesota, the nephew of Bill Barilko. All right, we continue the story. Bill Barilko, of course, got a lot of fame by scoring that goal, but there's the other side of the coin. He scored the goal on someone, and that someone was Jerry McNeil. He was the goaltender for the Montreal Canadiens that night, by all accounts, played spectacularly but will always be remembered as the guy who gave up the goal. And tonight, we'd like to introduce his son, David McNeil, who joins us now from Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's also the author of a new book about his dad. It's called In the Pressure of the Moment, Remembering Jerry McNeil. David, it's great of you to join us. How are you tonight? Oh, I'm happy to be here, Steve. Uh, actually, the book was uh, it came out five years ago, so it's not exactly new. Well, for an old guy like me, it's new enough. How's that? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to plug it. Let's start with some background on your dad. He was born sure. April 17th, 1926. So his 95th birthday is just a couple of days away. How did he end up with the Montreal Canadiens? Interesting story. Well, um, 1943, we're in the middle of the Second World War, and a lot of people aren't really talking very much about hockey. In fact, the NHL was actually considering not, not even playing uh, but they decided to go ahead, and uh, Mike McMahon, um, someone who was on the roster for the Habs, had seen my father play as a junior and uh, mentioned this to, to Tommy Gorman. So they sent him a, a letter inviting him to training camp. Uh, so in the fall of 43, at the age of 16, uh, my father took a train. It wasn't as glamorous as flying to L.A., but for him it was pretty glamorous. Uh, took a train up to Montreal and had a very good training camp, uh, at the end of which he uh, simply thought he was going to go home, and that was that, and he was offered a contract. Um, and he said, well, that's very all very nice, but I think I'll just go home. Uh, so they had to put his father on the phone, and they explained how much he was going to get paid. Uh, he was going to be put up at the Queen's Hotel. And, uh, you know, his, his father did some quick math and figured out that the salary was going to be a lot more than his own salary. So he said, put my kid back on the phone. So uh, Gorman got uh, my father back on the end of the, the call. And um, his, his father said to him, listen, Jerry, there's some things you just can't uh, pass up. And uh, they're offering you very good money. So I think you should stay in Montreal. So uh, he signed the C form. That made him the, the property of the Habs. Um, he actually... Um, impressed the Leafs uh, so much during the 40s that the Leafs uh, expressed some interest in him. But of course, he was the property of Montreal and they didn't, they didn't give up uh, his, their rights to my father until 1960. So uh, although his actual playing career with the Habs full-time goalie was four to five years. He basically, he was under contract with them for much longer and he practiced with them all through the forties. You needed two goalies in a scrimmage, you know, to practice. And he was always the, the second goalie. So they kept him in Montreal. He played for the Royals, uh, a senior team and, uh, and had a great time in Montreal. And also as an understudy with uh, Bill Durham as of course the, the main guy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we ended up in Montreal. Perfect. Never regretted it. <laughs> well, how, mu how much over the years did you talk to him about game five? Uh, it came up. 
Uh, now, when I was very young, I would just hear, oh, the Barilko goal. Oh, God, you know, someone else wants to know about the Barilko goal. Uh, and it wasn't until I was an adult that uh, I learned some of the details, and then we'd forget about it. But whenever it came up, uh, my father was always quick to say, that was the day your sister was born. So the morning of the game, um, my mother gave birth to my older sister, Karen, and um, she's uh, such a wonderful person that it was easy <laughs> to, you know, think of, you know, life with Karen or, you know, life without the 1951 Stanley Cup. Easy choice would be to have, you know, Karen forget the cup. So April 21st, 1951 is not the day of the Barilco goal in your household. It was the day of Karen's birth. That's right. I yeah. got it. Well, okay. It's still the Barocco goal. <laughs> That's not going away, but um, there was a lot of good, you know, that um, that we associate with the day as well. For sure. How much did your dad not appreciate being known as the guy in the Barocco picture, the goalie in the Barocco picture? Oh, um, that he, well, he, he grew to quite enjoy, actually. Uh, but in the interview that he did with uh, Alan Abel, he did uh, reveal that the first few years he found it a little rough. Uh, but, uh, you know, as uh, life went on, certainly into the 80s and 90s, uh, when there was a company that <clears throat> bought up his rights to uh, autographing memorabilia, and he was paid so much for each autograph, uh, this is a company located in Toronto, so they would fly him up for the day, sit him at a table with maybe Johnny Bauer, George Armstrong, maybe they had someone else, maybe Howie Meeker from the picture. Um, and he would sit there for nine hours with a break. They al allowed him to eat a sandwich and, and drink a Coke or something. But right back there, sign those autographs and come home with one big fat check uh, <laughs> from that. Um, and... You know, I, I think he accepted his role. He was um, someone had to lose. He played as well as he could, um, and it was close. He always he always maintained that fifty one was close. And look at the stats. You know, the shots on net, the footage that exists. And I'm thinking, well, you know, had you won game five, I'm not so sure you had much of a chance with six and you know, or even seven. And he would argue with me, oh, no, you know, we were going back. Home. It was almost as if he was right back there in the competitive moment. So he wasn't giving up on that possibility. Well, I don't uh, blame him, David. You know, every single game in that final went into overtime. That's never happened before. It's never happened since. So that was a pretty closely contested series, even though it only it went five games. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Now, you referenced an interview earlier, and I think we've got a clip of that standing by. This is from 2002. Your dad is 76 years old. And he's talking about that game. Okay, Glenn, let's roll it. Well, it, it. It seems to be sticking with me all my life because every so often up to these days I get uh, requests for autographs and in the mail and it, it just keeps bringing it back all the time. Uh, the other day I got a picture from the reverse angle that I was surprised to see and uh, this buck was still in the net. <laughs> the puck was still in the net. How, how did he feel? I mean, you said initially he wasn't thrilled about it, but he came around to understanding that uh, when people asked him for an autograph, it was okay? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it was an opportunity for him to brag about what he had done in the semifinals against Howe and company. Um, so, no, he uh, he didn't mind. And, um, you know... Uh, good for him i think uh it um uh, it was unfortunate i mean you know it uh, we're talking about of course bill barilko and my father but if, you know it's a team sport and howie meeker almost scored the winning goal he almost had that wrap around uh and of course there were a lot of people on the my father's team that contributed to the success that they had up until that point. Um, I mean, for him, it was always a team game. And one thing um, I remember is he said they never, 
They never spoke about a lost game, a goal. They never discussed it. They didn't allow it. And, of course, in the 1950s, there were absolutely no replays of any kind, hmm. right? So they're not watching footage of it. They had really no idea of what had happened. Uh, and it wasn't until later that footage leaks out. And it isn't until the 1990s, really, that uh, there's VHS and I get to see it. And I sit down and <laughs> I watch it with him. Oh, we must have watched it 30 times and trying to figure <laughs> out what had happened. And, well, tell me um, this. Did you ever ask him? And you know what? Glenn, I'm, I'm going to ask Glenn Dreyfus, who's in Seattle and producing this tonight. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. him to put the picture up, the famous picture up, because I wonder if at any point in your watching the footage, whether you asked him, Dad, what are you doing so far back in the goal? Yep. And what was yeah, that was a, that was an awkward question. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Um, he didn't have an answer. So it's not until we sat down and watched the live footage that you showed, showed earlier, you see Howie Meeker almost score on the wraparound. And my father got across and stopped it, uh, but the puck came out and there was a th another shot on net. Now, this is where my, my father and I lost track of the puck. And all we could come up with is it must have hit Butch, Butch Bouchard. Um, so I actually said to my father, you know what, why don't you call Butch? <laughs> and uh, he and my mother just burst out laughing. <laughs> I can imagine. I'm going to call Butch now. And what is he going to say? He's going to say, after 50 years, Jerry, you're going to blame me for the goal. You know? <laughs> so, well, here it is. Let's yep, see. I don't know. Here's Howie. Here. See? Yeah. Let's see. Did it Almost did it. Almost got it. So the puck comes out. Let's see if it we touches can't Butch see Bouchard. It. There, see, there's a shot. My father must have stopped that. There's the rebound that Barilko shovels into the top of the net. I mean, it was such a great goal by, you know, this is better than Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr was a easy give and go with Sanderson. And mm -hmm. then he thrusts himself into the air as a celebratory flying through the air. In this case, Barilko's actually tripped. And, um, you know, given the fact that Joe Primo, as I'm sure Kevin will point out a little later, did not want Bill to pinch in like that. Uh, that was a real gutsy move on his part. I mean, let's say Richard, who was in the background of that picture, had gotten the puck, gone up the ice and scored on the other end. Well, you know, maybe you didn't win in five games. Uh, but, you know, it's it in the end, it's just a hockey game. Right. Um, and um, there are other things in life that are more important. Uh, okay, I, although I can't think of any at the moment, but okay, if you say so. Family. <laughs> yes, I'm kidding. Yeah. I know. Okay. I think it's also worth remembering that even though the Canadians lost the Stanley Cup that year, that was, I believe, the first of 10 consecutive appearances in the Stanley Cup finals that the right. Habs would make. So they had a pretty, I mean, they had a pretty good team, didn't they? It was starting, you know. I mean, of course, they had won in the 40s, so they were never out of it when Richard got there. Uh, but Detroit was the, you know, dominated the league. They should have won six in a row. So they should have won in 51. Uh, the Habs beat them in the semifinals. And, of course, they should have won in 53 as well. Boston beat them in the semifinals. But otherwise, I mean, they ran the table, you know, between 50 and 55. Uh, real dominance. And uh, Montreal was always trying to get better. Now the Leafs were a dynasty from the 40s, and they were still, up, you know, very good in 51. They finished with 95 points. You know, they were only six behind Detroit. Uh, Detroit was, you know, after that, where they were used to winning the league by 30 points. I mean, they just really dominated. So uh, success against Detroit was... Um, was the big measure. All the accounts I read of that game five suggested that your dad basically stood on his head in the first period, which allowed the game to be as close as it was. Do you guys ever talk yeah. about that? Yeah. Uh, I remember him saying uh, more than once, you don't always win when you play your best. And he felt that 51 was his best playoff uh, performance. Uh, so I would ask, well, you know, what's better <laughs> uh, to win or to play your best? And he would, he'd come down on winning. You know, ultimately, it's a team sport. Uh, you win and you lose together. And, uh, you know, it's it's great to have individual, uh, you know, good performances. That's all very well. But it's hollow when you don't really win the prize. 
Um, so it was one of the things he learned, you know, you, uh, just because you play well, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful as a team. Mm -hmm. When it was discovered that Bill Barilko had in fact died, did you ever talk to your father about Barilko's death? Oh yeah. Uh, well, you know, there were books written about it. He had the books. Um, so definitely we spoke about, it. in fact, my father loved to fish, uh, you know, and, uh, I think Bill was as, as good a defenseman, as good a fisherman as he was a defenseman, apparently. Um, so yeah, we did talk about it. Now, of course, you know, it was a long time. I was only seven years old myself when the wreckage was found. So, uh, it wasn't until many years later and, um, and it was just very tragic. You see these pictures. You see how young and good-looking Bill Barilko is. What was ahead of him? Uh, family, for sure. You know, if he marries and uh, all the happiness that would he'd, he'd, he'd have remembering 51. Not even 51, but four, four cups in five years. Um, and my father, you know, he did have that. Uh, he was always a hab, and uh, he always had friends who were habs, and they'd get together. It could be Panama City, Florida, you know, and they'd remember the old days. And a good part of his happiness came from, you know, remembering what you did when you were young and successful. I think it's it's true of many professional athletes. And it's become some, sometimes a, a, it can be become a problematic when your life peaks at age 25 or 26. You mm -hmm. know, what do you do the rest of the way? It's a long denouement uh, in a lifetime. Well, speaking of those teammates, he was a pallbearer for Rocket Richard at, at the Richard funeral, which, as we know, was one yeah. of the, the legendary funerals in Quebec history. What did yeah. that mean to him? It was, uh, he recognized that he, it was so much bigger than he could ever understand. In fact, he came down to Halifax immediately afterwards because his phone wouldn't stop ringing. He says, uh, he told me, I'm so tired of saying the same thing over to hundreds and hundreds of reporters. Um, uh, so it, it was absolutely huge. And um, again, I think he just accepted his role. Um, he certainly had a relationship with Richard uh, as the, the, you know, he was the prankster. Uh, my father was the guy that got Richard into trouble with McLean, the referee back. Well, it would have been the same year, uh, 51. Uh, so Richard thought of him as the, you know, the, the troublemaker. He called him something else, a disturber. I won't use the word, <laughs> but, uh, and they played that right up until the end of, you know, in the last few years, they'd go down to Kenny Mosdell's cottage in Vermont. And one time they were, uh, you know, getting off the boat and, uh, and Jerry was, my father was ferrying the people back and forth. And he, Richard was the last guy left on the boat and he just sort of left them there and said, okay, rocket, you're on your own. You can swim to the shore. Uh, and, you know, Richard was screaming, McNeil, always the shit disturber, <laughs> you know, come back here and get me. <laughs> so um, they had a lot of fun together. David, I've got one last question for you, and it has sure. to do with that sweater over your shoulder, that jersey. Yep. Now, is that the real deal? No, no, no. That's the sweater that Ron Corey uh, got for the players back in the 90s, as he did uh, the Stanley Cup ring that I am wearing right oh, now. Wonderful. Can't really see that closely, but Ron Corey arranged for all of this. There were no Stanley Cup rings in the in the early fifties. Uh, my father got a tray, which uh, <laughs> has disappeared mysteriously. He could have sold it, uh, but anyway, the sweater was given to him then, and it was given with the number thirty because, uh, of course, number one had been retired for Jacques Plante. And my father, you know, I said, "Yeah, well, you know, Jacques was great, and I recognize all the records, but." damn it, I was one before Jacques Plant, you know. So he says, fine, dad, we'll get the 30 taken off and we'll put the one on it and you'll be number one again. So um, I don't wear it because I don't feel, you know, I'm worthy enough. But every once in a while, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, Trish, will wear it to a game or an event. I think that's great. Um, my son-in-law once wore it to the Bell Center. So, uh, you know, it does get worn. And I even had a goalie wear it once and, uh, you know, pick up hockey that I play. And that didn't go well. I didn't think he, he uh, 
really played as well as I thought my father would have played. But, uh, you know, I love to have the jersey. I have a stick on the other side of me. So, yeah, I do have a little bit of memorabilia, and um, and uh, I don't know where that will end up. But, uh, you know, we'll see. Hmm. There's the portrait. That's an Aussie suite, I swear, from Sport Magazine, February 1951. And uh, Ozzy, of course, would be famous for the similar portraits of Richard, Howe, Plant, Bobby Hull, and Gordie Howe. And uh, Ozzy loved the red, you know. <laughs> so those are all red sweaters. Um, That's a great portrait. It is, yeah. It's, uh, David, we can't yeah. thank you enough for joining us tonight and helping to remember your father and the role he played in this most important goal in the history of the Toronto Maple Leaf franchise. So thank you for sure. joining us. Happy to have been here. David McNeil from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Well, let's continue our look down memory lane here at the 70th anniversary of the Barilco goal. And our next guest, how do we describe this guy? Well, he's a former goaltender, uh, formerly with the Toronto Maple Leafs and the St. Michael's Majors before that. He was a scout and a general manager for the Maple Leafs. And he attended... Game five of the Stanley Cup final in 1951 on the 21st of April. He was a 16-year-old kid at that game. And let's find out how Jerry McNamara ended up being at Maple Leaf Gardens that night. There's the man. Hello, Jerry. How are you tonight? Hi, Steve. Very well. Thank you. It's great to see you. All right. So you're a 16-year-old kid in 1951. You're a student at St. Michael's College School. How did you end up at that game? Well, one of the lucky things that happened, I wasn't playing hockey that year. And what the Maple Leafs did was they give players that they brought down south passes. And one of the players at St. Mike's wasn't interested in going to game, so he gave me his pass. And a good friend, Tommy Lemon from Kirkland Lake, uh, he had a pass from the Maple Leafs. So we used to go to every Saturday night game. How and was we, it possible that a that a guy who had a free pass to go to Maple Leaf Gardens <laughs> for Game Five of the Stanley Cup Finals isn't interested in going? <laughs> I don't know. I just know that I was I was happy to go. Uh, Todd Sloan played for the team. He's a Falconbirds boy, and uh, of course I was uh, excited for what he did in that game. But anyhow, what we did was we get to the gate, the pass gate and waited for the gate to open. And as soon as the gate opened, we rushed upstairs to the Blues underneath the bandstand and got a prime standing room seat, not a seat, but a stand. And so we watched the game from there. And one of the things that happened in that game that excited me was that Todd Sloan scored both goals and he got the tying goal with less than, I think, 30 seconds left in the third period he tied the game up and now tell us about wh why todd sloan was important to you because i guess it was the saint mike's connection eh well todd was a saint michael's boy but also todd was a falconbridge boy and up in falconbridge nickel mines uh, northern ontario we had about 800 people in the town and of course everybody knew everybody uh, that also was the hometown of george armstrong so uh, uh, Falkenbridge had uh, an, uh, a reason to be watching that game. Uh, every game you got a chance to see either Sloan or Armstrong play, everybody was glued to their TV. Hmm. It's interesting. You know, had Bill Barilko not scored that goal in such dramatic fashion, we might be talking about Todd Sloan tonight because he got, as you point out, the first goal and the second goal, the tying goal for the Leafs with, I think, about 32 seconds left in the game. Yes. So he was a real hero that night, too. Well, he was always a hero of mine. And, <laughs> and he was a hero because without his goals, they wouldn't win that game. Mm -hmm. Now, given that you yourself were a goaltender, I presume that on that night, you were watching in particular Al Rollins and Jerry McNeil do their thing. What do you remember about how they played that night? Well, I remember they were both great. Uh, Jerry McNeil was a great goaltender, and so was Al Rollins. And one of the things about Al Rollins, he was about six foot two, which is how tall I was. And there weren't very many six foot two goaltenders in the National Hockey League playing goal. 
It was, they weren't like Ken Dryden back then, I guess, right? That most no, of the goalies were all, small. They were all five foot eight, five foot nine, hmm. five foot ten. There were no tall goaltenders. We were hmm. the two tallest goaltenders. Now, Jerry, as you think back on that Barilko goal in overtime, can you still see it in your head? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I got to be honest with you. I saw the replay because uh, I couldn't figure out why Jerry was down. And after seeing the replay with Holly Meeker coming around and he fell, he fell on his uh, rear and he was scrambling, <laughs> trying to get to the puck and trying to get up. But obviously you can see that Broke will put the puck up high and he had no chance. Now, you being a goaltender, I presume you look at that footage and you've got your eyes all over that goalie and you're thinking to yourself, what? Well, I, I would have done what he did. He got to the corner and stopped Meeker, but I would have tried to stay on my feet. And I'm sure Jerry wanted to stay on his feet too, but stuff happens. <laughs> and as a result, he went down and he had trouble getting up because... The puck was coming back at him, and he tried to do the best he could. Jerry McNeil uh, was a really good goaltender. As a matter of fact, in 57-58, Jerry McNeil knocked me out of a job with Rochester. Yeah, we got to tell that story. That's a great story because you're, you're at tr Rochester Americans training camp several years later, and you're competing for goaltending duties with Jerry McNeil. Jerry McNeil. Yeah. Montreal and Toronto split the team. And Jerry McNeil was there, and he won the battle. <laughs> so, and the other thing is, you, you had uh, the Barilicos on. Uh, Alec Barilico, I knew him. He was a fellow scout. So there is a connection. Hmm. When you were at the Rochester Americans training camp in the late 50s, and you're looking across at Jerry McNeil and competing with him for a job, I'm wondering if the 51 overtime goal ever came up in your conversations. No, I, I wouldn't bring it up anyway. Goaltenders don't like talking about goals they let in that they thought they might stop. <laughs> so you guys never discussed it, eh? No, we never discussed it. Were you tempted to bring it up? No, I never do that. Then I wouldn't hope anybody else would do it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take you now to 1962, Jerry. And when the news came out that Barilko's plane had been found and the wreckage had been found and the mystery was finally over, do you remember how you got that news? I heard it on just the general news like everybody else did. And um, I was mesmerized in the papers reading about it uh, because I remember when it happened. And of course, it was such a mystery Everybody was, they had all kinds of things. The communists got them and, you know, it's a, there were wild stories out there. And finally we found out what happened. They crashed. And he was only, I guess, 75 miles from home. And That's how did the news sad. hit you when you got the news? What's that again, Steve? How did the news hit you when you heard the news? Well, I was glad that they found them because finally all the, well, you know what happens with all the, uh, people making up stories and they finally found out and that put everything to rest. And we found out that they had crashed not too far from home. Hmm. Jerry, how do you remember Bill Barocco today? When you think back on him, the kind of player he was, what do you he think a, of? He was a tough player. He liked the body check. Uh, he and Bill Juzer liked the body check. The, uh, they were the toughest guys, I would think, on the Maple Leaf team. And uh, they made their presence felt. What kind of career do you think he would have had had that tragedy not befallen him? I think he would have had a great career. He looked like he was going to be a really good player. The first I heard about him, he played in Hollywood. And they brought him up from Hollywood. I don't know how Hollywood got out there, but the, the, the Leafs must have had some players out there. But he came in from Hollywood, and he never went back. And I thought he was going to be a great player. Hmm. How lucky a guy do you feel that you were at that game 70 years ago next Wednesday? You know, I, <laughs> I felt really lucky that night. But 
tonight, seven years ago, that's a long time. And I wish it had been a little later and I'd be a little younger. <laughs> Jerry, you're a very young 86, I have to say. Uh, thanks. Uh, we're so glad you could spare some time for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on this 70th anniversary. Steve, thanks very much. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jerry McNamara, former general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and of course, a 16-year-old St. Mike's student who was there that night in Maple Leaf Gardens 70 years ago on the 21st. All right, let's continue our look back at this anniversary, and we want to introduce somebody else to you now. He's a lab technologist at Brantford General Hospital, just west of Hamilton, for those of you watching from the States and wondering where Brantford is. And you're asking yourself right now, why in heaven's name are they having a lab technologist from Brantford General Hospital on this show? And the answer is, welcome, Brian Donahue. And the reason oh, Brian Donahue is on this program is that his family has the puck. That's right. Take us back to that night, April 21st, 1951. Your grandfather and your then 16-year-old father are at the game. Barilko scores the overtime goal, Brian. And what does your dad do next? Uh, with, all the, with all the chaos that was going on in the celebration, uh, my father uh, said to his dad, that, can I go get the puck? And he, uh, he went and got the puck. While everybody celebrating, he went and grabbed it. And uh, on the way over the boards, uh, somebody offered him like 20 bucks. Uh, and dad had said, no, it's, it's, I, I'm going to keep it. And he brought it home. And uh, when he brought it home, uh, my grandfather and him, actually my grandfather, uh, he uh, went and got a trophy made for the puck to sit on. And uh, so the puck stayed at the Wellington house where my uh, dad lived and my grandfather had the business there. Everybody at Wellington House in, in Hamilton. Uh, and the odd time, or most, anytime uh, somebody wanted to see it, uh, dad would go up to his uh, upstairs to his room and bring the, the trophy down and show the patron at the Wellington House. Um, and then um, the, uh, I first that thought, it oh, that's, it, yeah, that's it, right? it there, yep, yep. So he made up this little plaque. This plaque was made, yeah, my grandfather made it up and uh, dad put the puck on top of it and there it sat. And um, it sat at our house on Judith Crescent in Ancaster. Uh, and then when we moved to uh, Maureen, the, uh, the new house, it came with us. But I've always uh, noticed the trophy and the, uh, the puck, but never knew the significance uh, and the history behind it, uh, mm -hmm. which makes it uh, uh, fabulous, but a tragedy at the same time once you start learning about the history of the puck. Um, so, now, Brian, just to be clear yeah. here, after mm -hmm. the game ended, after the goal went in in overtime, your father actually went onto the ice and retrieved the puck himself from the net? Yes, he did. Yes. And we, uh, my brother Dan and uh, Nicholas, his nephew, uh, did some investigation uh, because when my dad had passed away, everybody was interested in this puck. You know, did you want to sell it? Uh, I'll look after it. And so we kind of said, well, let's look into it. And uh, once we started seeing the history behind it, we says, oh, this is uh, Bill Barocco's uh, winning. And, uh, and, and there was further investigation. So they went down to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, to, uh, to loan it to them, and uh, they already had a puck there. So uh, they did further investigation, and uh, my brother did a, a uh, looked at some pictures from CBC, and actually the pictures that were shown today, uh, I was trying to see if that puck was shown there, but um, yeah, it was in the corner, and we have pictures of this lanky 16-year-old well, man, a younger boy, uh, go towards uh, uh, the net. And that's your and, dad. And we think it was our dad. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But the puck, we do have a picture of the puck in the net. It was understand that the goalie, or not the goalie, the referee had pulled it out. Uh, but if you look at the pictures, the referee goes right by it uh, and continues down the other end of the, uh, the ice. Um, but uh, further pictures can show that the puck was actually there as well. So, Brian, uh, let's be super clear about this. The Hockey Hall of Fame in downtown Toronto has a puck on display 
yeah. which says this is the puck that Bill Barilko used to score the winning goal, but you've got the real puck. That's not the real puck. As we understand it, yeah, because the puck that's there, the uh, the insignia on it was uh, supposed to be Spalding, and that was, um, I got a date here, from 1920 to 1942, and we have the puck uh, in the timeline that uh, Bill had scored the winning goal. Uh, so um, there's some evidence there as well uh, that uh, we have the puck of the same caliber of that time period. I'm going to ask Glenn. Se I'm going to ask uh, Glenn Dreyfus one more time if he can bring up the puck that you have, and we can see the close-up logo. The one on the left. Mm -hmm. That's that's the puck you guys got, and that's the one with the Art. Ro you can see under where it says National Hockey League. There's Art Ross's name, and yeah. the Art Ross logo. Mm -hmm. That was on pucks used after 1950, and that's the one you've yeah. got. That's the one we have. Yes, yes. And the other one you can see there is the puck. That uh, as I understand, is sitting in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Which they use in the 1940s. Right, right. Well, and you can well, see the, the puck, too, is uh, their puck is a little more uh, damaged than our puck. Uh, um, and there was a reason for that. I don't, uh, Dan would know more about it. He did most of the investigation. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's even that timeline um, is uh, kind of proof that we have the puck of that time. But my dad did say that this is the puck. Nobody can tell you any different. And there's no reason for him to put it on his uh, this puck other than the, the fact that he uh, pulled it out of the net that night. And it was a trophy for him. Like I said, it's like catching a baseball at a baseball game. You know, you're a kid and it's a trophy and it's something you keep and, and uh, tell your friends and that I caught that ball. But he caught the hockey puck. And that's well, is it, so, is it true your dad said to you and your brother at some point, don't let anybody tell you that we have not got the real puck because we do? We do, yes, yes. He was adamant about that. <laughs> and he kept it, you know, he, he never bragged about it, but he said, yeah, that's that's the puck. Once he had passed away back in uh, 2013, uh, people were coming up and asking about the puck and wanted the puck, wanted to buy the puck. And uh, so we said no. And then uh, uh, we further investigated, of course, and said, no, we know why they want that puck. So um, so we've, we've kept it. And uh, Mark uh, Farrow, um, or Farrow, I'm sorry, is um, he has it now uh, as a loan for um, his display with the um, Bar Barocco um, setup. Memorabilia. Yeah, yeah we, we should, we should memorabilia. just explain that. We should just yeah. explain that, Brian, because Mark Mark Fair is a guy who, uh, you know, for a bunch of reasons, has just decided to become sort of the prime aficionado of Barilco memorabilia. He has, I think, about 150 different items, including mm -hmm. parts of the fuselage of the plane uh, yeah. where where Barilco died. And so you have loaned him the puck for yes. the purposes of what? This will be uh, put on display and taken around, and uh, any money that was raised through this display will go to charity. And uh, that way uh, we can give Bill's legacy um, uh, something uh, valuable for charity and as well as honor uh, my father as well and uh, bring uh, bring a lot of history uh, to the hockey, uh, hockey league as well and the Barocco family. Now, I gather at some point uh, your brother yes. went to the Hockey Hall of Fame and said to them, you guys have got the wrong puck. You've tried to resolve this with the hall, have you not? Uh, my brother has been talking with them. Um, I can't say exactly what was said, um, but we definitely uh, uh, know that uh, we now have Who's in this puck. picture here? Uh, this is my brother, and uh, the gentleman, I'm not familiar with him, um, so I, I'm not too sure. But that's Dan on the right? Yeah, that's Dan, the, the tall guy. Yeah, yeah your brother. brother. Yes. And he's showing the puck. Now, when yep. you guys were kids... And, yes. and, and this puck was in your home. Mm -hmm. What did you guys do with it? Well, uh, the thing is we pull it off the trophy and we play hockey with it in the basement, uh, not knowing the street behind it. Uh, we roll around, play hockey, it's just the games with it. Um, and then we throw it back on the trophy, uh, the trophy, a wooden trophy stand. And it was just roll off and roll on. Um, and uh, yeah, we just played it as like a toy. 
uh, and they sat at on marine um, uh, for years in the den in the um, you know, on display and uh, yeah, there I just is. always that's, remember that. Yeah, that, that's the best shot right there where you can absolutely see Art Ross's yeah. name under National yeah. Hockey League. I yeah. mean, that would that would seem to be definitive proof that um, you got the real one and the Hall of Fame does not. Yes, 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 and uh, yeah. So we're we're standing by that <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the information that we have uh, from the uh, investigation that my brother did, Dan, and. Um, and, uh, and Nicholas as well uh, contributed to the investigation, and um, so yeah, so this brought us all together. And with Mark uh, looking at it as well, um, putting this whole exhibit together, uh, it's been to me quite an interesting uh, a journey. And listening to the uh, uh, the family talk about it, and that I know it'd be tragic to lose your your son or your brother um, and not finding them. 10 years uh, would be terrible. Uh, but the poor guy, he's just, you know, starting out and doing very well, young, uh, had a lot of potential. And, uh, but I think he's uh, continuing his legacy uh, through the puck and through this exhibit that Mark is setting up. Well, Brian, I, I mean, I hate to raise painful memories for you and your family sure. here, but the uh -huh. reality is you lost a brother who was yes. only 15 years of age yes. when he passed away. Bill yes. Barilko was only 24 years of age when he passed away. Yeah, Both yeah. your families were touched by tragedy far too soon. And I wonder whether you think that somehow connects your two families. That puck connects your families. Yeah, what they, what, definitely. With what my uh, parents went through for losing a son and me losing a brother as well um, was terrible. Um, we were fortunately we could uh, bury my brother, uh, Harry uh, J. Um, where the Barocos could not do that. And uh, I, I would be terribly devastated uh, over the years knowing where, where my son or my brother would be. Um, so yeah, I, I've got a feeling uh, of what they've gone through. And, um, and it's terrible uh, to go through. Uh, I think we grow from it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. Brian, it's awfully good of you to spend some time with us tonight here on the That's Hockey my Time pleasure. Machine. Thank you. And to talk to us about your family's role in this yeah. wonderful anniversary, wonderful and tragic anniversary at the same time. Yes, yes. So thank you well, so thanks much. for having me, Steve. I appreciate that. Not at all. A great pleasure. That's Brian Donahue, uh, whose dad picked the puck out of the net 70 years ago next Wednesday. Okay. Let's continue on. We're going to talk to the guy who more than a decade ago wrote what is clearly the definitive book on this whole story. The book was called Without a Trace, which of course describes what happened to Bill Barilko in August of 1951 after he went on that fishing trip. And we're delighted to welcome back to Hockey Time Machine, the guy who normally does what I'm doing tonight, and that's Kevin Shea. Kevin joins us from Ajax, Ontario. Kevin, how are you this evening? Hey, I'm doing well, but boy, oh boy, am I enjoying this program. I mean, you're doing such a great job. And to hear Frank and David and Jerry and Brian tell their stories, all these different, different, uh, just intertwined uh, stories put together, just, uh, just phenomenal. Just really enjoying it. Kevin, in my experience, people don't write books because they want to. They write books because they have to. There's a story that they feel they just absolutely have to tell. Was that the case for you and the Brilka book? Yeah, without question, Steve. It, it's an odd situation, but I was working at the Hockey Hall of Fame at the time, and I would watch people come in on a regular basis and request the Tarofsky photo, the, the great photo that we see from behind of Billy scoring the goal on Mr. McNeil. And they would ask about it on a regular basis. So Tyler Wolosiewicz, who was the uh, receptionist at the time, I, I sat him down one day and said, you know, it seems like we, we get an inordinate number of requests for that. He said, oh, yeah, by far, it's the most requested photo in the Hockey Hall of Fame's archives. He said, even far beyond the Bobby Orr goal of 1970. So so I started to think, and I thought, oh, wait a minute, hang on for a second here. We've got access to the Hockey, Hall's, Hockey Hall of Fame's resources. Anne Klesnich and her husband, Emil, and their son, Barry, are volunteers here. And in a previous career, I worked at MCA uh, Records. I was the, the director of national promotions, and one of our bands was the Tragically Hip. And I got to know them very, very well. And 
was there during their, uh, I mean, their glory years continued for decades, but, uh, but was there during the time that, that wrote Apples and fully completely were coming out, fully completely being the album that had 50 Mission Cap on it. So it was as though a light bulb went on over my head as, as thinking, you know, I, if anybody should write this book, it should be me. And off we went. Hmm. As you make the decision then to tell this story, you have to make a decision about how many people you have to talk to or can talk to. And as you made that list, who needed to be on that list for this project to achieve its mission? Steve, I didn't even, I didn't even set any parameters at that point. It, it, funny things happen. 2015 was the lockout year. So all of a sudden I wasn't going to leave games two and three times a week. And so I was able to stay at the hall of fame until just before one o'clock when the last train to Ajax was leaving. So I was able to, to research like crazy, but I just put together a list in tandem with Ann Klicinich and others as well, and wanted to speak to everybody who could tell me about Bill Barocco the person as much as Bill Barocco the hockey player, which we knew a fair bit about already, but we didn't know anything or very little about Bill Barocco the person. So I just set upon list after list of people he played with, people he, he knew in Timmins, um, relatives, people who knew Dr. Hudson, who he flew with on the ill-fated flight, et cetera, et cetera. And I just ran down the list and spoke to everybody I could possibly speak to. And I was able to fill most of them, most of them into the book. And it was really a, a wonderful exercise because as we look back now, as you mentioned, it was about 15 years ago. Most of those people sadly are, are no longer with us. And uh, so it's great to be able to have chronicled their stories for the Barocco legacy. Were many of his teammates still alive? Yeah, they were. It was uh, it was really quite amazing. Uh, uh, so people that I spoke to, Howie Meeker, Danny Lewicki, John McCormick. Uh, I talked to Mr. McNeil. Dave McNeil was able, not a teammate, obviously, but uh, Dave McNeil was wonderful to set me up with an interview with his father as well before we lost him. So it was great to be able to, to really get a handle on what he was like at the time, just some of the funny stories that came up that are are not told any longer. But when he first came up to the team, he was at his very first practice, and he was at the uh, at the uh, the rink, and they're they're working away there, and he's body checking his teammates, and they really solidly, and they had to pull him back a little bit and say, "Hey, come on, hurt the opponents, but don't hurt your teammates." <laughs> so he came up with a little code: if he was going to hit one of his teammates, he was going to do the road runners meep meep. And they would know that, okay, be prepared for a shoulder or something like that. And so these little stories that come up that just make the legacy and the legend that much more interesting. Hmm. Do you know who made the actual decision to put his number five in the rafters? Well, it started at the time of his his loss. 1951, Con Smythe said during the, the pursuit of trying to find the body that no one would ever wear number five again. Now, now curiously... He, Bill only wore number five during the last season of his uh, his career. He'd worn two other numbers before that, but number five, he had taken over from his defense partner, Garth Bush. And so Bill was wearing number five during that 50-51 season, and Con Smythe had made that, uh, that, that statement. They did not retire it officially, but nobody wore it again until the time when they, uh, they retired both Ace Bailey's and Bill's uh, numbers in a ceremony at, uh, at center ice. Hmm. Now, interestingly, they, they did retire six for Ace Bailey, but then uh, they took it out of retirement for Ron Ellis, but nobody's worn five ever since, right? That was a special dispensation that, uh, that Ace Bailey, who was working in the penalty box at, at Maple Leaf Gardens for years and years and years, and had really admired the play of Ron Ellis, a good, hardworking guy, played, played the game clean, but tough. And so Ace Bailey was the one who went to leave management and said, would you be willing to take my number six and give it to Ron Ellis to wear through the duration of his career and then re-retire it? And uh, they thought about it and decided that if it came from Mr. Bailey, it definitely was worth considering. And they did exactly that. And it's the thrill of Ron's life. When you talk to Mr. Ellis, he'll tell you that besides playing for team Canada 72, his biggest thrill as a Toronto Maple Leaf was to wear that number six on the back of his uniform. Well, you did a great book on him as well, so you would know. Yes, indeed. Uh, I want to ask you a bit of an odd question here, but did Bill Barilko have a girlfriend back in the day? 
Well, from the stories that I heard from his teammates, Bill had several girlfriends, but there was one in particular that uh, that stands out, a lady by the name of Louise Carley. And Louise was a lovely, lovely woman. I met her later in her life, uh, spoke to her for the book as well. But but there used to be uh, luncheons, and, and as it continued on beyond the pandemic, luncheons where we get the alumni together. And Louise used to come quite often and come with Ann Klisnich and Jim Thompson's uh, wife, June, as well. And they were characters. The three of them together over lunch were just characters. But Louise claimed that she was Bill's girlfriend. And she she definitely was one that uh, he squired and, and lovely lady. She wasn't sure whether she was engaged or not, but Bill had given her a ring. And she was the one that we feel Bill left behind. He was supposed to go down to her cottage on Lake Simcoe before his uh, before training camp started. And he just never showed up, which was too bad. Now, having said all of that, every Monday, the Leaf players and their wives or girlfriends would gather at the Old Mill restaurant in the West End of Toronto. And so Bill would quite often bring one of the former Miss Torontos to that dinner as well. So so whether I, there was no commitment, he was just dating different girls and enjoying his, his bachelorhood at that time. Hmm. How did her life turn out? It's sad, not tragic, but sad. She never found the love that she had hoped she had found with Bill. And so she she clung on to his memory through her entire life. She was married a couple of times, had a lovely family as well. She kept Bill's photo on the nightstand beside her bed through her entire life and pined after the love that she had. She really felt that uh, that he was the one for her, but it just never came to pass because he uh, he passed at the age of 24. Hmm. Kevin, uh, I have purposely not asked any of our previous guests any questions about the details of Bill's disappearance because you are the chronicler. You are the, the historian here, and I wanted to leave it to you to do that. So again, for those uh, who may be watching tonight who don't know the details of the story, I wonder if you would take us back to that August of 1951 and tell us how the fishing trip idea came together and what happened. No, absolutely. So there are many people who claim to be, to have been asked by Dr. Henry Hudson to join him on this final fishing trip of the, uh, of the summer. And uh, so it goes from Alan Stanley, who couldn't make it, uh, Bill Curick, who was Bill's best friend, uh, Lou Hudson, the brother of Henry, was supposed to go as well. Archie Chenier also claims. So it was one of those situations where timing was such that none of them were able to go. In fact, Lou was supposed to go and then the plane was too heavy to take off. So he decided to take his things off of the plane and let Bill go on his own. So here they are and they're making a, a fishing trip plan at this point. Bill loved to fish. The irony here is that he hated to eat fish. So, so here's his chance to go and they're going to fish for Arctic char, which I'm a vegetarian, so I, I can't say definitively there, but but apparently are just a wonderful, wonderful fish and and really a, 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 a favored dish for so many people. And they're going to fly up to just off of James Bay in north of Quebec to go fishing, a place that Dr. Hudson uh, liked to go. So he and Bill decide that they're going to go and they're going to leave on Friday, August 19th. And I hope I've got that date right. August 24th. Sorry, I better make it right here. Well, this was odd because Bill's mother pleaded with him not to go. Friday was an unlucky day for her because her husband, Steve, Bill's father, had passed away on a Friday. So she didn't like the, the aspect of Bill traveling on a Friday to do anything, let alone go on a plane trip. There's Theodosia. They called her Baba. Or, or they uh, called her Faye as well. She's giving Bill a sip of champagne from that 1951 Stanley Cup. So Bill defied her, decides he's going to go after all. And his mother kind of took a cold shoulder to Bill. She didn't want to speak to him at all because he was defying her at this point. Bill borrowed some money from his sister, Anne, Frank's mother, and uh, decided to pay for the gas and to help out in every way they could that way. And they decide they're going to take off Friday, August 24th, and head off to Seal River in northern Quebec. Well, they go up there, and, and uh, they had to refuel along the way. They end up there, and apparently the, the fishing was outstanding. And they filled the pontoons of, of the Fairchild 24 little prop plane uh, with fish. 
they're heading back and they have to refuel once again. And, and they stop in Rupert's house, which is now called Washaganish. They stop there to refuel. And while they're there, they had met the gentleman who had fueled them on the way up. And uh, Bill offered him a fish from the pontoon. Dr. Hudson wasn't very pleased with that. He, it, Bill, just give him a little one. And Bill just, oh, come on. And so he gave him a real nice Arctic char. And, and the young man was just uh, thrilled at that point. And that, from the best that we can ascertain, was the last time that anybody saw Dr. Hudson and Bill Barocco alive. Uh, about, um, ab about four o'clock that afternoon, they take off again, but the gentleman, James Crawford, was really concerned that the weather was too threatening and that they shouldn't go. And he offered them, hey, listen, why don't you stay here at the Hudson Bay uh, Center that we have here? But they said, no, no, we have to get back. We'll be fine. And apparently the plane had trouble taking off could be any number of different things. It could have been the weight of the plane. It could have been the wind. It could have been any number of different things. But that's the last that they saw the plane. It took a long time for them to, uh, to find out what happened. They were supposed to return on the Sunday. There was a going away party for Bill at the Keurig house. Um, Dr. Hudson had his practice and he was supposed to be there on Monday morning. Alan Stanley was supposed to have some work done. And uh, they didn't arrive, uh, Bill didn't arrive back on the Sunday for the, uh, the party, but nobody was all that concerned. They thought, well, whether the weather was bad or whether the fishing was so outstanding that they decided to stay a little bit longer. So they weren't overly concerned uh, when Dr. Hudson didn't come back on the Monday. Again, his, his receptionist didn't, uh, didn't take it too much. This has happened before with her. So she canceled the appointments and said, oh, we'll reschedule you. But then when they didn't come back later in the day, they're, they're, ended up being great concern for them. And uh, all of a sudden, the word started to go out that they had disappeared at that point. By the Tuesday, it was everywhere. And that's exactly it. It was in all of the newspapers. It was on all the radio stations as well. The story broke and the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force went on a mission to, uh, to try and cover the, the remote areas of Northern Ontario to try and find the plane and the two men that were with it. And uh, they didn't have any success. They tried over and over and over again all through that summer. And finally, when the weather got bad, they had to abandon their plans to try and find Hudson and Barocco at this point. Con Smythe offered a, a reward of $10,000 personally for anybody who could give the information that could help them find Bill Barocco and Dr. Hudson. It was an odd summer. Besides Bill Barilko, um, the the head scout, uh, Squib Walker had also passed away, and their former president, J.P. Bickle, had passed away too. So Con Smythe was apoplectic. He had lost his star hockey player, his star scout, and his dear friend J.P. Bickle as well, all through that summer. The, uh, the search continued again year after year, but the hopes obviously diminished and evaporated, although obviously Faye Klicinich, Faye, sorry, Faye Barilko never gave up hope, as, as Frank so eloquently said as well. And it wasn't until 1962 that they found the remains of that plane in a, in a most surreptitious sort of way. They found the skeletal bodies of the two gentlemen still strapped into the plane just north of Cochrane, Ontario. Thank you for that, Kevin. That was a, a, a really good and thorough recitation of what happened back then. I, I do want to ask a few follow-up questions about that, though. Sure. Namely, how is it possible? Because I, uh, I've read the book, and I, I, the, the search they put on to find that plane was intense. How is it possible that over 11 years, nobody ever found it? The forests of that area, first of all, they didn't know exactly where they were. So they searched over 100,000 square miles trying to find any, any semblance of an idea. And there were all kinds of false things. Somebody found a, a windshield, thought it might be from the plane, but it wasn't. But the, the forest is so dense and, and it was so difficult. Nobody could get into that area to even search by, by foot. It all had to be by air. Um, the muskeg, the, 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 the squalor of, of, of uh, land all around that area were almost impossible. They were impenetrable, I guess I should say. And then it was just an absolute fluke. Um, June 6, 1962, a gentleman by the name of Gary Fields is working with a helicopter company and he's flying around and he sees a glint of metal. Maybe it's a little bit of yellow from the, uh, the plane and he thought that's unusual. That shouldn't be in this area. 
And it just happened to be right place, right time. Who would have thought, you know, a day or two before or after, maybe they couldn't have seen it, but he was able to see a little bit of something. So he went back to his, his base, asked about it, and, and different people offered different suggestions, including the Barocco Hudson crash as well. He knew the area, so they went back and, and found the area again, and he dropped toilet paper over the area so they could find it a little bit later on. And so it took a little while, but they were finally able to land and march their way in. There was, a, a, I guess, a little bit of a platoon, to use a, a terrible uh, phrase, but who, who joined? Uh, newspaper people, Peter Worthington from the Toronto Telegram. Um, you know, flight people, just different people who were involved with, with the area. They landed about a mile away and they had to march through the, the, the swampy muskeg to get to it. And then they finally found the Barocco, Clis or the, Barocco Clisnish, the Barocco Hudson plane there with the plane going almost vertically into the ground. And they did in fi fact find the skeletons in the plane to solve that mystery. And were the remains of the two men eventually repatriated to where they belonged? In other words, is, is, was, were Bill Barilko's remains finally sent to Timmins and put to rest? Yeah, they were indeed. In uh, June of that year, 1962, they were sent off to Timmins to be, to be buried. Um, Frank Klisnich, as we know, was just a young boy at the time, but he was at the, the graveside of his uncle as well. Several Toronto Maple Leaf players were there, friends and family were there as well to, to offer their final respects to the, uh, to the memory of, of Bill Barocco. Just to parallel that, Dr. Hudson was having a funeral, not at the same time, but in just around the same time as well with his family and friends as well. Hmm. Kevin, I, uh, I'm going to pay you a compliment here that Frank told me about. Frank said that... Um, the Barilko Klisinich family regards you as a member of the family because the connection you established with all of them during the course of making the book uh, really established you as a member of the family. I presume you feel the same way too. I'm honored beyond compare to be very candid with you. Whether it had anything to do with the Barilko story or not, Anne Klisinich and her husband Emil and their son, Barry, I didn't know Frank at the time, but Barry were dear, dear friends from the Hockey Hall of Fame. We would sit and talk and, and they would ask me stories. I, I have this great thirst for information about the Toronto Maple Leafs of the 1940s and 50s. So I was able to talk to them about that era of, of the Leafs and prior to the dynasty, but also the dynasty as well. And then we really got into it during the, uh, the making of the book as well and, and uh, would have dinners at their home, um, when the book came out, cute story, but I mean, I just love Anne so much and, and the family. We went down to Windsor, Ontario, which is my hometown, to do a book signing down at the chapters down in Windsor. And by the time we got there, the book was already sold out. We were amazed. But my dear mother is so much like Anne, it was uncanny. They sound very similar. They have that same girlish enthusiasm for life even though they were well uh, well into their 70s and we've lost them both since but it, it brought me even closer when my mother and Anne found a great friendship as well Frank in the meantime I, I got to know through the years and and talked to him about various things Anne gave me the privilege of I don't know if there was a privilege I, I look at it as a privilege but so many people wanted to use Bill's image for one thing or another quite often it was hockey cards and because she didn't know a great deal about it, and I knew a modicum of information, uh, she said, look it, I want you to deal with these things. So if they put something out, and sometimes it was after the fact, I would deal with the, the company and get money for the Klesenich family, which Anne would then share with both Frank and Barry at that time, and Frank and his uh, children as well. So they made a little bit of money as a result. Um, I gave gave Anne uh, proceeds from the book, uh, some of the partial proceeds from the book as well. We just grew so close together through our years together, and losing her was, losing Emil was a, a great blow. Losing Anne was a great blow. Thank goodness I still have Frank and Barry as dear dear friends. So I look at them as as part of the family as well. Steve, beautiful. I want to ask you one last question, and that is, and I'm going to do a bit of a setup here. Uh, about 15 years ago, I wrote a book on a former Ontario premier named John Robarts, who had a really great premiership, but who 
uh, was lost to suicide in his uh, six, around his 65th birthday. And uh, by the end of it, now I was a year old when he became premier. So I never knew him. I never even saw him. I, I didn't know him at all. But by the end of it, I end of writing the book and having talked to a hundred of his colleagues, I remember thinking, gosh, I sure wish I had met this guy. And I wonder whether you had the same feeling after spending so much of your life researching, looking into, making connections with Bill Barilko. How desperately do you wish you could have met that guy? More than you have any idea, Steve. I felt like I knew him, even though he, he would have been much older than I was. But because I knew him through 24 years of his life and got to know so much about him, about his, his, his life with his family, he was a real family man, about the, uh, the, 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 the friendship he had with his many friends. He was just loved. He was the, the life of the party everywhere he went and just loved by his teammates and their, and their wives and girlfriends as well. Uh, getting to speak to people that he he uh, he he went to school with, that he partied with, that who are his relatives, made me feel like I really knew him. And in many ways, like the the rest of the Klesnich family, in many ways, I felt like I was part of his family and he was part of mine as well. And to this day, even though the book is long in the rearview mirror, I still do research on Bill and come up with the the odd thing. I'm enthralled by the stories of of salvaging the the wreckage from that area north of Cochrane as well. Um, it, it just so many stories have come out, meeting new people, or because my name is attached to uh, to Bill quite often, wouldn't say often, but probably 10, 11 times a year, I'll get an email from somebody who offers more information or asks me a question that leads me on another foray. So I, I really, really wish that I could have gotten to know Bill Barocco beyond just the research that I did. I know exactly how you feel, my friend. Yeah. That's the great Kevin Shea. And that's our program for this evening. And uh, as I invite Paul and Laura and Glenn to come on up and um, sign us off and remind us about the Zoom feed still to come, uh, let me also add one last thing, uh, folks, and that is that um, I, I host a current affairs program on TVO, which is public television in the province of Ontario, and we never cover sports. We just never do. We cover death and destruction and COVID and all these other terrible subjects. But I managed to convince my bosses next Wednesday on the 21st of April, the 70th anniversary, I managed to convince them that we're going to do a half hour discussion, half the program on the most important goal scored in the history of the Maple Leaf franchise and the great story associated with it. So set your watches for next Wednesday, April 21st, 8 and 11 p.m. on TVO when we have that conversation. Paul, Laura, Glenn, I pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate you uh, hosting tonight and everyone who gave their time to us. Um, it was an awesome evening. We learned so much. And um, Paul, do you want to say anything? Well, I could just say, wow, we have professionals like Steve and Kevin and, and family members and opponents, sons. Just, you get the true story. You can't get better than that. And, um, I'm fascinated by it still. But the book uh, story and uh, actually the actual game itself still exists, the 51 game. And I, I wish they would show it on some station so people can see the whole game that way. And I think I will send the first period to Jerry's because to David because his dad Jerry played uh, well in the first period and and um, I just remember Frank Mahal was telling me that he talked to Rocky Richard and he asked Rocky, do you think if Bill Broco would have uh, lived, would he have um kind of player would he have been? And, and the Rocky said he would have been a Hall of Famer for sure. That's all you need to know. Well, if everyone left this program, do us a favor and click um, the thumbs up button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, click on the subscribe and click on the little bell because then it'll give you a notification every time we go live. And I just want to say thank you so much, Glenn, for uh, doing all the photos and the videos and all the pre-production work and the work now. It's, uh, we can't do it without Glenn. So. And none of the photos and videos would be possible without Paul <laughs> having them in his massive vault that only he knows the combination to. And occasionally he, he goes in there and unlocks it and 
brings out stuff nobody's ever seen, and we all get to be better for it. That's right. We didn't even show the first goal um, Bill Broco scored in his first home game. And of course, he scored his last one, his last home game. And maybe we can show that in the after party. Well, why wait for the after party? Um, <laughs> let me see if I can find it now. Here we go. There he is. Cool as a cucumber. Yeah, the second NHL game, first game in Maple Leaf Gardens. And Sid Smith also brought up for that game. He also scored his first goal in that game. Number 21, yeah. first year. Yeah. And the one other picture we didn't get to that I'll show is nice. Bill's name on the Stanley Cup. Right. Can you show the um, photo of um, the Donahue dad on the ice? I wouldn't know. I'll show a, a couple of pictures. You can tell me if you see him. Okay. Well, that's the goal. See, that, that's another story in itself because there's more than one puck on the ice. Uh, we haven't figured that out. Who threw a, another puck on the ice or two pucks? And uh, maybe one of those the Hall of Fame has. But the photo I'm talking about is a still image from the post game of the 51 Royal Celebration. And in it, you see Mr. Donahue, or we think it's him, heading towards the net uh, to pick up the puck while everybody else is going the other way in the celebration. And that sort of convinced me that um, the Donahue family really had the puck because I, at first I was skeptical. I thought, well, it can't be. but. When I saw the footage, well, that uh, it's me. Paul, do you know where that issue with the puck stands now? Do you know what the Hall's official stance is? Well, officially, they have to claim that they still have the puck. Unofficially, they know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, All right. That's it. <laughs> Everyone, uh, if you're going to be joining us on our Zoom, just give me a minute, and we'll uh, we'll start the Zoom, and we can continue over there. And we'll uh, close out with a song. No shortage of cinderellas in any mining town. All dream of coming back home. Bill, won't you come on home? Shall